Coming up on the live and interactive AXA legislative lunch break, Edgar and I will get you all of your latest news and information from the state capitol and CDE with an in-depth analysis on how it impacts your work. Also today, State Representative Megan Dolly is here to talk about the new legislative session and legislative priorities on the Education Committee. The AXA legislative lunch break starts now. And it's just after one o'clock. We welcome you on a Wednesday to the live and interactive AXA legislative lunch break, along with Dr. Edgar Zazwata, AXA's executive director. I'm Naj Alakan, AXA's senior director of marketing and communications. Welcome. We are honored to have you today. Go ahead and jump onto the chat and say hello. Let us know where you're watching from. Edgar, how are you? Good, Naj. I, I see Neri. Not only was he one of the first ones, he helped us uh, commemorate i know a day that we're, we're acknowledging here at axa as many around the world are that it is international day of the woman uh today and yeah and i know it, it gave us the opportunity to kind of reflect on where we're at as an organization yeah. and you know some of the numbers i think it, it's easy to take this for granted but i think it's worth celebrating like for example we look at our numbers now i think about 60 hopefully i don't mess these statistics up but i think it's about 62 percent of our members are female. Uh, we've obviously had some great growth. While at the same time, you know, we, we're doing better in California than we do in another, a lot of other states. Like, for example, with superintendents, I think the number uh, nationwide is about somewhere between 25 and 30 yeah. percent of superintendents are female. Here yeah. in California, I think we're in the 40 percent, 45, 48 percent. So we're, we've made some growth. Obviously, I think we acknowledge that in some areas there's still some of those gender barriers that we have yeah. to still confront. But uh, yeah, I appreciate Neri throwing out that as something we've been talking about here at AXA today. Yeah, certainly uh, work to be done still to address some of that data that you just brought up. Also want to say hello, Jamie Green, who was our guest last week um, over on the chat today, Ty Bryson, Donna Campbell. Uh, so good to have all of you guys with us. I do want to uh, also make mention of another key date. Um, we, we just talked about the, the honoring today, but yesterday was Edgar's birthday. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any photos to prove it, but Edgar turned 21 yesterday. So, so excited that he turned 21. What did you do for your birthday? Yeah, uh, 21 times two and maybe a little bit more. So, that, yeah, uh, it was actually a very, it, it was it, being a Tuesday, right? It was besides all the fun I get to have here at AXA, right? I know the staff uh, surprised me with a, a nice uh, cake, actually multiple cakes. And and it was just, it was a quiet evening with family and kids and whatnot at home. So yeah, no, it was, uh, it, it, it was nice. And, you know, I felt the love definitely from our members and from, from some folks I got to spend some time. I saw Terry Rupert uh, there in the chat and also wishing me birthday. I got to spend some of it with our friends, with the small school districts association. They were having, their conference here in Sacramento. So shout out to SSDA and the great work that they did here this week. And I think they had more than 400 uh, uh, members uh, from the small school district community, which is actually very fitting since today uh, we have the SEMA member Dolly who represents a lot of these folks. So yeah. Um, yeah, just kudos to the work that they did there, our partners at SSDA. Uh, a couple of news headlines for you, and then we'll bring Megan Dolly onto the show, Edgar. Um, you know, I, I have uh, never hidden my advocacy for school safety, and I want to bring up something that's happened over at LA Unified in an effort to streamline their communications platforms. Um, they've launched two new apps. Now, one designed for parents and students, people in the community, but the other one is the one that I took notice. It caught my attention. This other app is going to function, according to the LA Times, like an internal 911. School employees using the app could alert school police about an active crime on campus by simply holding down a button for three seconds. And because of location services on your phone, on this app, school police will be able to better respond to any of those alerts on campus. Edgar, I think this is great that LA Unified is using this type of technology for this type of system. I know that um, that's a big district. So this has to be very, very wide, but it's something for us to consider for all of our school districts about how we can leverage technology to better support the safety of our students, our staff, our educators. 
Yeah, now even when it's not on the headlines, it's, it's this this issue of public safety in our schools is something that obviously our folks are constantly thinking about. Obviously, we've had some of those high profile incidents that have caused people to really think about what are we doing to keeping our folks safe. So yeah, this is one example, a innovative way of using technology, right? I know some of the questions we're gonna ultimately get or folks will get, you know, in some schools, I know in my my daughter's high school here in Sacramento, they're they're trying to keep them away from their phone, right? Yeah. They're, they're actually trying to have them <laughs> put it away. But I think nonetheless, I think the reality of the situation is a phone is something almost all of us have on hand. And so how can we better utilize that to keep all of our folks safe? Yeah. So uh, props to LA Unified for that. I did want to also bring up this um, this piece on the equity multiplier. We've been talking about this for several weeks now. Um, we had uh, members of our AXA governmental relations team here uh, to talk about the equity multiplier. Let me just give you this information. This comes from the Legislative Analysts Office. Um, it says, in the governor's proposal, just to give you the background, a package called the equity multiplier that was designed to boost funding to improve outcomes for low-performing schools and subgroups. That's a $300 million budget item to support high-poverty schools. But the LAO, which is the state legislature's nonpartisan fiscal and policy advisor, released a report uh, saying that additional funding is not the key issue, and they recommend rejecting the funding increase. They recommend that the legislature, quote, consider options to provide better transparency, greater transparency, rather, regarding... Uh, how funding is spent across schools. They go on to say, quote, in particular, we recommend using the number of teachers, teacher experience as teacher qualifications as a proxy. Uh, they also recommend that the legislature clarify whether supplemental and concentration grant funding can be used to target these low performing racial groups. Okay, so we've talked about the equity multiplier, as I had mentioned, gave you a little bit of a background. I read this report, and we're going to give that um, over on our um, on our chat. You can go ahead and take a look at that as well. Are, are you surprised by what the LAO said, especially when we've heard, you know, about the budget and budget deficits and how the governor's planning to balance some of these budget deficits mm -hmm. in the budget process? Yeah, I think they're questioning. I think obviously the LAO, and it's their job to, to advise the, the legislature in terms of what are the proposals that the governor's putting forth that make some sense, maybe areas that they could go in a different direction. I think it's twofold on this. Yes, because they're questioning some of the expenditures just because of the fiscal situation. On one end, that's that part of the, the, the conversation. On the other end, I think it's a conversation that a number of us groups are having in terms of some of the stated intent for this, this pot of money, right? I, again, just to give the quick 101, these are dollars that are going to be generated at, at, from a school site level for, uh, for depending on the number of students that you have that are, are eligible just for free meals, not free and reduced like we usually have, but just free meals. One of the underlying conversations here that kind of was with the impetus for this whole conversation is what are we doing for some of the historically, uh, some of the populations that have, we've had challenges moving the needle. Mm -hmm. For example, African-American students in, in the state. And I think that's one of the questions that folks are at least having out loud. If that's one of the stated purposes, knowing that we have some constitutional issues, we can't call out racial uh, subgroups in, in terms of like that clearly in the statute. So they have to work around that. But if the, if the goal is really to address some of these groups, should there be a more direct line? It's, it's a place we're asking the same questions. I think at yeah. Axel, we haven't formally endorsed or, or whatnot that the governor's proposal, but I think it's one of the things we're going to want to see where this conversation plays itself out as well. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, I just want to point this out. Uh, Principal Katie Kohler, who I believe is a first-time viewer, at least a first-time commenter, it says here, Chicago Park Elementary School District. So I'm trying to figure out, Edgar, because I have not heard of that district before, if that is in he here in California or if it's in Chicago. Because if it's in <laughs> Chicago, Katie, we've got some some things to discuss about the Bears coming up uh, this year. So we have a big state, Naj. I'm sure of the thousand districts. I, I would not be surprised we have a Chicago uh, I, elementary here in our ranks. Hey, you know what? It just pops up. It's certainly surprising. Grass oh, Valley, there she says, California. Grass Valley. Grass Valley. Okay. Let's go ahead and bring in our guest today. We're honored uh, to have Megan Dolly, California State Representative from Assembly District 1. Uh, with us today. Uh, Megan, it is it is an honor to have you with us. 
Uh, so glad to have you here on the AXA Legislative Lunch Break. Um, last week on our lunch break, we had Jamie Green, um, one of two superintendents, to talk about some of the issues with rural schools. A as you know, because you were quoted in that story, uh, which came out in the LA Times about federal advocacy. And let me just read a couple of your quotes. Um, Having school administrators plead for forced reserve dollars every few years is not sustainable and they don't have the resources of bigger districts for expenses like grant writing. We need to solve the funding issue once and for all and get back to the business of educating our kids. Uh, so tell us what can, from your position, having to go out there and advocate for federal funding is one thing, but how is it that state lawmakers may be able to support our members in the rural schools and then federal lawmakers as well? Well, first, thanks for having me today. I'm excited to speak to both of you. I have one of 11, represent 11 counties um, from south of Lake Tahoe to the Oregon border. And most of my district is very rural. Um, our own boys graduated from high school with just 52 students. So we're, I'm very familiar previously on a school board and rural education has always been a passion of mine since being elected. So the secure rural schools funding is vital to keeping our schools open. You know, even if you only have 10 kids in your school, you still need a building, pay your, you know, the, the electricity. So that is something that um, we really need our federal counterparts to fight for us and to solve it once and for all. But here in the, at the state level, we are funding our schools. And mm -hmm. I'm excited that at, at historic levels, but we need to make sure the funding is getting to the classrooms as well. So the one size fits all model doesn't work for my district. And that is why I've been a, an advocate for um, rural schools specifically, running legislation directed towards our rural schools and funding. Assembly member, again, thank you for, for joining us. Um, one of the things, and I'll give you this share, and I see in the chat, you know, representatives there for Placer County Office of Ed are actually underlined one of the things I was going to uh, say, and they took the words out of my mouth, but actually I was going to quote the people in, in your district, that one of the things we always hear, especially about you and then about Senator Dolly, about how responsive you've been to the folks in your community, how you don't pretend to have all the answers that you're, and as it's stated there in the chat, <laughs> that you're calling the, the leaders to ask them how things are that are being done here in Sacramento are gonna impact them. So just thank you, on behalf of them, thank you for, for everything you're doing there, for uh, really involving and, and, and engaging your, the leaders in your community. On this issue um, that, that Naj asked about and you just spoke very eloquently about, the one thing, and we get schooled on this and we try to be sensitive to, and I like how you said it, that the one size fits all model doesn't always work, especially when we're talking about small schools, small school mm -hmm. districts, rural schools. We'll talk about frontier schools here in, in, in a minute. The, the thing being that it looks different in your communities, right? That like the job of a school leader, of a school administrator is very different than it is in the urban setting for a number of reasons. That's why I appreciated last week's conversation to kind of put some spotlight on that. From the state perspective, what do you think can be done? You know, whether it be funding or things in the budget, from your perspective, what more can the state do to help some of our, our schools and our students in communities like the ones that you represent? So when I ran the AB um, 2337, which is my frontier school district, I was surprised to find that we didn't have a specific ed code definition for those frontier schools. It was available at the federal level, which again, we're talking about secure, secure rural schools and federal funding being attached. So it at least has been recognized historically that we need those federal dollars for those schools. And so my plan was, let's just define my frontier schools zero to 600 students, because I'm, I'm trying to get an accurate number of how many I actually have in my district. And so from there, we can build out specific funding for them. For instance, if you have a superintendent principal, which I have many in our schools, that looks very different for them, like to write plans, which I know we're going to discuss that later. But, um, you know, even in the LA Times article that you were referencing, one of the one of the superintendents didn't come because they had a teacher that was unavailable and they're stepping in to teach in the classrooms. So I don't think that's standard and maybe LA unified, but it is in our region. And so just to continuously have these conversations and to put those spotlights on our, our small and rural schools, I think is vital. 
um, a conversation we have a lot here in Sacramento and it's coming to um, is we have staffing shortages in every area, um, in every career. Right now in our schools, we don't have paralegals, we don't have enough teachers. And so our schools are vital, not only for the students that are in, in school right now to have an excellent education, but they will someday be in the workforce. And so our small schools, they need all of the, that they can get to make sure that they're gonna be healthy and thriving and productive citizens as well. Uh, folks, if you have any questions for Assemblymember Dolly, go ahead and put those into the chat. We'll tackle those uh, a little bit later on in the show. Uh, during last week's Assembly Education Committee informational hearing on schools emerging from the pandemic, you used the phrase plandemic, which we've never heard before. So I believe you've just coined a new term here in public education. Um, what does this term mean to you? Um, and what can we do here in the state to to help and support that? So that that term actually came out of some of my um, working groups that we do. We Zoom a lot. Um, obviously, again, 11 counties. We try to get every superintendent of, on our counties on a call and just ask those questions. What can we do? How can we? And so something that's come up you know, during COVID and um, just through our conversations is they have to write dozens of plans. For, you know, it's great to say that we're going to put $300 million into mental health, but if they have to write another plan on how they're going to get those dollars into their classroom, that's really burden. It's a burden for our small schools and our and small school administrators. So that's what that's what the, I'm referencing to. We need to, if it's a portal that the state needs to come up with, or there has to be some way that they, when they write their plans in their LCAP, that if they're repeating and just duplicating that over and over and over in you know, dozens of plans, we have to be able to, wait to make that streamlined. I just think it's um, streamlining government and it's time away from our kids. It's time away from our students. And um, I know that our teachers and our administrators are doing the hard work. And if we're adding more burdens to them, it's, it's just, it's taking us backwards instead of forwards. So that's what I meant by pandemic. Yeah. I, it wasn't actually my term. I heard it from someone. <laughs> oh no! Come on now. Yeah, We're going to say that's your term. That's that oh, now yeah, belongs yeah, yeah. to you. Uh, wow. Yeah. No, I've heard variations of it, but that 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 and and it, it actually, I I think in all seriousness, I think you're making a lot of friends. I see Terry chiming in there, but it, you can't walk into a room of school leaders, administrators without this issue coming up now. In terms, and I I can only imagine there that we hear this from even the biggest school districts who obviously are dealing with a little bit more capacity, more students, but, but the, I think it's fair to say they have more capacity, more people to help with these plans. Uh, and we hear it from them. I can imagine, and I, I know you're a voice here on for why this is even a bigger issue in terms of uh, for, for smaller districts, for more rural districts. Maybe I'll, I'll just ask a follow-up quickly here. What advice would you give and I know you probably get the, this question when you have folks lobbying you every single day. Mm -hmm. And I know this is an issue that um, we constantly get asked about, like folks want to come to the Capitol to talk about this or issues like this. What advice would you give to our folks that are trying to get the state maybe to go in a different direction when it comes to an issue, for example, like this reporting piece? What, like in terms of messaging tactics, what, what would you say to them? So one thing I, I ask people when they come in to, to meet with me or on any issue is give me a specific example. I what what we do, the Dallies have done now for years as we tell our story. Right. We live very remotely. Our our kids went to a, a high school, of 52 students. Right. So we just continuously tell our story. So if you have specific examples of I had to write four plans to receive this amount of dollars, but it was this many hours of my staff time to get that done. And I've asked many times, how many can you quantify? Can you give me an amount of that have come across your desk, a possible grant that you could have written, you know, tried to apply for, but you just moved it aside because you didn't have the staff to apply. I fear that is something that happens a lot in our district, in our schools, because you, you don't have a grant writer on staff. And so you just pass it on. You just, you just can't, you just move, you know, you don't, you don't take advantage of it. And so I don't know how we could ever, um, really collect that data to know how many dollars our schools miss out on. Thank you, Assembly Member. So one, one other question come from me. This also, I think, came up in the hearing last week. Uh, it's an issue that got brought up a ton during the pandemic. And I think it was an issue before the pandemic, 
but it, it only uh, exemplified how we need to make some strides on this. And it was this issue of the lack of, of broadband access, especially in rural communities. We, we saw that uh, firsthand. Well, I credit some of the rural schools and some actually smaller schools and folks, I think we're nimble. You know, it was some of, we saw this around the state. They were some of the first schools to open up. I think one of the necessities of even being more aggressive to open up schools is because some of the things that we take for granted about like getting on a Zoom and being able to access education or virtually just wasn't a real option. What, what can we do? What more needs to happen on this issue of the gap in broadband access? Well, we need to we need to move forward on projects immediately, not in three to five years. I mean, when we talk about there's um, six billion dollars of federal fund coming in for broadband projects, and we we need we've been talking about it. I've been on a broadband working group, but as we must move forward because these projects will take time to get there. And in and just um, in my meetings this week, you if we're talking six years to get a project done, there are students during that six years that aren't receiving the education that they could have if we could just get these projects done. So, you know, Senator Bradford just yesterday in committee brought up, he had a AB 1299, which was, he was in 2013. And it was a $20 million project um, in his district that is still not completed to bring broadband to his community uh, with concrete ha government housing. That project is still not completed. So there has to be more accountability on how we can get these jobs done fast. My district will be a mosaic of things. It's last, it, there, it isn't just the last mile or middle mile. You know, we're not gonna be able to trench and bury every line across my district. You know, it might be satellites. It might, you know, there's gonna, we're gonna have to be really um, creative on how we get it done. But I think that um, getting these $6 billion spent and started is key and the most important issue right now is to make sure that we get these projects going. Um, I know Edgar had mentioned uh, frontier schools, frontier districts. So mm -hmm. let me let me ask you this. A bill you authored last year became law recently. It created a new definition for certain types of school districts, frontier districts. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about these districts and what you can see for them in the future? So my hope with the frontier school district was just to have a very clear definition, because when we, we talk about it a lot here in Sacramento rural communities and that they, you know, the one size doesn't fit all. And it, that's ac across our state. We have a very, we have a, a huge state and it's very diverse. So there's a lot of members that have rural communities. But I, I found as I'm talking and telling our story that we're more than rural. We are frontier. We have frontier hospitals. So um, that was my hope with this is just to clearly define our frontier schools and then moving forward through, you know, my tenure here, hopefully being elected, I'm going to be able to pass legislation to have set aside dollars for our frontier schools specifically, because declining enrollment is something that's happening statewide. But our schools are vital to our communities. We can't just close a school. And when say, you know, I've had these conversations with people, oh, just combine those schools. Well, it might you might have to travel over a mountain range to get to the closest school. So um, it's not really an option for us. So those are the things I'm going to continue to work on is to make sure that our, our smallest and um, have a, a true voice. And also, I'm going to reintroduce my Rural Education Task Force Bill, which is also um, vital, I think, in having, in having a place in the Department of Education to have our voices being heard in a way that will, will craft legislation, legislation and policy moving forward. Kind of a follow-up question on this frontier school. I mean, it doesn't have to be just frontier school. It could be just, just a rural school or even a small school in, in a lot of areas. Is the issue of transportation. I know we had a mm -hmm. question there from California Education Partners about if you could speak to what are you hearing from, your, uh, from, from the folks in your district about the challenges, not only the expenses, but the logistical challenges of providing school transportation in, in, in these type of communities. Oh, absolutely. And I think something that's been highlighted through our conversations with our superintendent is electric buses, right? Like all of us, that'd be great. <laughs> We'd all love to be electric and, um, and and some schools are moving in that direction, but we're finding it's been really challenging in our mountainous areas. They can't pull the grade um, and specifically like Redding, California, which can be over a hundred degrees. They overheat. Um, they can't do the long bus routes without another charge. So these are things that um, 
again, back to the one size doesn't fit all, even though we might be able to, tra we'd lo love to transition to an electric bus or be able to even write a grant or receive one. There's a lot of challenges around that as well. So, you know, some of our students have to travel 45 minutes on a bus. That's a long time for a six, yeah. a six year old to be on a bus. And that's reality in our district. Uh, we have this question that came in from Gary Reller, who's over at Riverside Unified down in Southern California. He asks, um, well, he says schools up and down the state are having difficulties in balancing student behavior issues and campus safety. What do you think needs to be done at the state level to support student safety when the safety is impacted by student behavior and the difficulties of suspending students from school? How, how would you respond to that? So, well, it's true. I mean, so we have we have two older sons and then a, a daughter that's 13. And that there, there's been a gap, right? I mean, as far as a 10 year gap between our, between our kids and behavior has definitely changed in the classroom and it's challenging. I've been in classrooms with teachers who are trying to um, navigate that and, 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 and for the health and safety of all students. I also think that we need to discuss, um, we have I, IEPs, and, you know, I think there's there's something happening with our youth and, and even our kindergartners coming in where we have some serious behavior issues. And I think we're going to have to have some further training um, for our teachers and administrators and and how we're going to be able to wrap around those like those family services as well, because it is real. And then also you have a student sitting next to that student who, um, you know, when they dump over the trash can, they're not really sure how they're supposed to react to that mm -hmm. with the student next to them. So, um I definitely think there's work to be done for sure. All right. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, oh, I, I don't know about Edgar. I don't make my, I don't make trips up to assembly district one too often for somebody who's a novice. Then what's the one place that I have to go to if I travel up North? One. It's a one, big area. Huh? <laughs> She's all like, one, <laughs> one place. And, and the, look, okay. So I have follow up like, questions. Do you want to be outside? Do you want to hike? Do you want to be on the river? Yeah, not, I, 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 I say, yeah, let me, I, I say, yes. I want to hear outside. Yeah. Yeah. Outside. Well, one of the best places I believe, and you know, is Bernie Falls. Have you ever been to Bernie Falls? Mm, uh, yes. Okay. Well, I'm that familiar is with it. Stop at 299. And it doesn't matter if you go in the summer or the winter, it's absolutely gorgeous and um but we have beautiful mountains as well mount shasta yeah. mount lassen lake tahoe i mean i could sit probably for an hour and just tell you all <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying bernie falls that's where edgar yeah. and i have to do a road trip to yeah. yes and so when you get to bernie falls you can just keep coming to my house yeah. and then there you, you go just, there we got go. an invitation perfect <laughs> Uh, St State Representative Megan Dolly, Assembly District 1. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been an yeah. honor. We look forward to having you next time. Thank you so much. Um, Edgar, let me uh, let me give a couple of pieces of information here. If you'd like the show, if you like what you uh, have been watching and you haven't subscribed to us yet, shame on you. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Um, in doing so, you will get alerts when we're about to come on live and uh, you will also get alerts about our acts of legislative lunch break. So go ahead and subscribe to us on YouTube or like us on Facebook. And we like to tell great stories here at AXA. If you have a great story happening in your district, we want to be able to tell that story too. Go ahead and email your information about that story to our Ed Cal editor, Michelle Carl, mcarl at axa.org. Want to also make one more mention, Edgar, uh, that the Department of Healthcare Services is going to be hosting a two-part webinar workshop series uh, titled Funding School Health Services Through Medi-Cal. It starts March 23rd. It is also on April 20th. I believe you have to be there for both of those. Uh, more information, we'll put that uh, into the chat. Um, Edgar, any final comments from you? We heard a lot mm -hmm. about um, what the outlook up for our rural schools, but I think that we, you know, with, heard school safety. We talked about technology, some really important topics that uh, the assembly member was able to hit on. Yeah, it feels like it's been the theme of the last couple of weeks, at least for, for myself. I know we had it here on the show. I just talked about going to SSDA, obviously having uh, Megan Dolly on the show today. It, it just it further emphasizes 
the need. And I like how she said it, you know, like that one size doesn't fit all. And that's something, frankly, that we're taking seriously, even at AXA, not just from an advocacy lens, but how do we provide professional development? What's the content that we need to provide? What is the support services that maybe our leaders in these type of unique communities, which, and I say unique with the acknowledging that the vast majority of our school districts are actually small or rural. I think we talked about this last week, uh, but I've, I'm glad that we've been able to kind of put a little bit more light on the unique challenges that many of these communities face. Yeah. Uh, folks, we are not on the air next week, uh, but we will be on the week after. Um, so definitely mark your calendar for that. Looking forward to seeing all of our great members at mid state conference this weekend in San Luis Obispo. Edgar, I wish you were joining us this Bummed time. To miss it. This is the first time in a few years that, uh, that I'm missing it, but I, I think you and Yvonne will, will, you know, carry the flag. Uh, very well there for us there at, at mid state, but a great conference. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to everybody that's involved in putting that together. It's one of the, I would say of our regional events Now the AXA, the mothership, if you will, doesn't put on, but our members and our regions really coming together, they do a great event. So I think yeah. everybody's in store for, for a great weekend of, of connecting and learning there. Yeah. And if you haven't registered Senator John Laird, assembly member, Don Addis are going to be there. We're going to do a live in-person edition of the Axel Legislative Lunch Break. Yvonne and I are going to be hosting. Hey, no that. pressure on Yvonne. Hey, just maybe a little bit of pressure. But, no, you know, no, no he, pressure. He, he, can, he can handle it. He, he's got it. <laughs> so get those tickets now if you haven't registered for that. And uh, that's all for our show today. Have a great rest of the day and rest of the week. We'll see you next time here on the Axel Legislative Lunch Break.